Hey, I'm Nathan Tabor with Handling Life. I really appreciate you uh, joining me today. And I've got a really special guest to talk about some of the things that have gone on in his life from business to marriage to all kinds of different things. And his name is Paul Moore, and he is the managing director of Wellings Capital. And he's based in the Virginia area around the Lynchburg, Roanoke. Uh, Paul, thanks so much for joining me today on Handling Life. Hey, it's great to be here, Nathan. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, I've enjoyed uh, getting to, to know you through you know real estate and actually doing your podcast. And um, I'm, I'm always intrigued to find other uh, businessmen or women who are involved in doing you know great things in business space, but they're also you know, bringing their faith into. They're not leaving it outside um, the door. They're really integrating it into what they're doing. So I appreciate you doing that. You bet. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, love to talk about that topic. There's so many things we can chat about. So uh, yeah, great to be here. So give us a little overview of, you know, who is Paul and, and what have you, where have you been? What are you currently doing? And, and, and give us a, a good overview, a flavor of who you are. Yeah. So uh, during high school, I wanted to be a parapsychologist, Nathan, which means I wanted to be like a ghostbuster, somebody who researched the occult. And uh, then I found out there was no degree in that, which was uh, quite a surprise to me. So I always had these spiritual leanings. And then uh, I went out and tried to become a Mormon, and that didn't work out. And then I became a follower of Jesus. I found out that God really loved me, and he really did have something, uh, a plan for my life. And so I graduated from engineering school, which was probably a mistake for me. I should have been in business, and I got an MBA after that. went to Ford Motor Company, um, found I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I left there after five years and uh, started my own company. And our staffing firm was really popular. We actually uh, sold it to a publicly traded firm five years later. I was finalist for Michigan Entrepreneur of the Year a few times. And then I launched into a phase of being an investor or actually a kind of semi-retired in my mid-30s, which was a huge mistake because I was this high-energy, type-A driven entrepreneur, you know, trying to run a little dinky nonprofit and kind of relax. And I thought I was going to be this great husband and father. We moved from Detroit to the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, bought 120 acres and tried to start a nonprofit organization and got really, really bored. So started flipping houses before flipping was a thing. And then it turned into building houses and then uh, flipping high-end waterfront lots at Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia and uh, done all kinds of real estate, ended up on HGTV, wrote a couple books on real estate uh, investing, and uh, was a multifamily syndicator, did a couple projects along the way, and then now we found ourselves uh, starting these two funds to give investors access to high-end, recession-resistant commercial real estate projects. So you, you've got quite a uh, resume there, you know, in that time period when you were in your thirties talking about slowing down, um, were you where God wanted you to be, or was it something that Paul wanted to do? You know, I don't think I, I, I thought I was, and, but I became the worst version of a father and a husband, I think. I mean, maybe not the worst there could have been, but the worst version of me in my history, yeah. because I wasn't doing what I was called to do. You know, I thought, I always thought, you know, Nathan, missionaries are like here, you know, and, uh, and, and if you're seeing a video, I'm saying real high. And then yep. there was church pastors and elders and leaders. And then way down here were business people. What I didn't realize was that there are no second class callings in God. When I became a believer in Jesus, I was recruited into full time ministry on that day. And whatever I yep. do is a ministry, and it's a way to uh, make God God's ways known to the world. You know, as believers in the marketplace, Nathan, we have lots more opportunities to see God work and to influence culture than most pastors. And I've had pastors tell me that. You know, uh, there are uh, a couple guys, uh, Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham from YWAM and um, Campus Crusade got together in the, I think it was the mid 70s or, or 80s, and they came up with this thing called the Seven Mountains. And they realized, you know, from a couple dreams and visions that they had had that 
you know, there are seven mountains of influence in the world, and the church or religion is only one. There's also family, there's government, there's business, which includes science and technology, there's arts and entertainment, uh, which includes sports, there is government, <clears throat> there's education, there's all these mountains. And you know, where God's people have uh, basically said, well, you know, uh, Hollywood's going to hell, so forget about them. Well, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, or governments just filled with uh, liberals and the Antichrist. Well, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because where light leaves, darkness takes over. And as believers, we need to be involved in all those areas. And the cool thing I found, Nathan, is we don't have to lead. You know, one or two percent of each of those mountains influence and actually control the destiny of that entire sphere of culture. Well, we don't have to be in control. We don't have to be the president or CEO to have massive influence. And we, if we have time here, we can talk about how we can have influence. But a couple examples, uh, think about it. Joseph wasn't Pharaoh, but he basically massively influenced the entire Egyptian culture and the world. Um, Moses, obviously, wasn't Pharaoh, but he had a big influence in a different kind of way. Esther wasn't the king. She had a massive influence. And Daniel wasn't the king, but he had a massive influence on the entire world. We can too, because if we believe we can, and if we position ourselves, we can have great influence on the CEOs, the mayors, the school board superintendents, the pastors, whoever sphere we're in, we can have great influence on them. And God can do great things through us to influence the whole culture through our relationship with those people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the Bill Bright and the Seven Mountains, I got to know uh, uh, Bill Bright and his wife, which is, you know, they wow. both passed on and, and, and going to heaven now, but just a an amazing thought a writer i mean just amazing what he did for the kingdom and you know talking with him uh he always said you know you got to follow that calling that god has placed on your life and i don't know when it changed you know i'm, I'm 45 so i don't know if this has always been a thing but i've seen at least over the last 20 25 30 years that people feel like if they're not called to be that missionary or they're not called to be that pastor that God doesn't really have a role for them. Yeah. And that's kind of what you touched on earlier. And God does have a role for everyone, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. we're all called to be ministers. Yeah. Not absolutely. ordained, you know, pastors, but ministers of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely true. We could take the rest of the hour telling stories about this. Can I tell one? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Well, there was a guy named Mark, and Mark worked for an atheist. Jewish boss who was the CEO of his company. And Mark didn't know what to do at his company. You know, he didn't know how to bring Jesus to his company, but he he went around and he if if he saw somebody who had a headache or a problem in their life, he offered to pray for him. Well, one day the CEO came down the hall and he was moaning from this migraine headache. And he took a big gulp and he, he went out and he said, Hey, I'm gonna pray for you and God will heal you. And he said, Okay. So he prayed for his atheist Jewish boss, and God healed him on the spot. Well, a few months later, they were at a convention, like a trade show in Las Vegas, and they had rented a zip line operation. And the zip line was where they were going to bring all these customers in of the CEO, and they were going to put them through the zip line and give them a great experience and have a tent, you know, for its refreshments and all that. Well, there was this massive thunderstorm coming toward the area and uh, they were going to have to shut it down the zip line operator said we can't do this with this thunderstorm coming in we're going to have to shut it down it looks like in five or ten minutes as the storm rolls in yeah and so the ceo says oh no no you don't have to hold on hey mark come here <laughs> he says mark there's a storm coming in so go ahead and pray that it'll change directions and then mark goes uh seriously okay uh, hold on. And Mark goes around the corner and he start text, started texting his friends and family and says, pray now. Uh, the CEO asked me to do this. While he's texting his friends, he hears the CEO 
telling their customers, uh, okay, so it looks like a storm here, but don't worry, because Mark is going to pray, and, uh, and God's going to turn the storm clouds in a different direction, and we're going to go on with our event. The CEO is just announcing this as a fact, just like Mark had when he said he would pray for his headache. Well, somebody texts uh, Mark back and says, um, I see a dome of protection over the zip line, and I think that is what's going to happen. So Mark goes out there and he prays, and uh, the storm literally split in half and went to the left and the right of the zip line, and the, it didn't storm on the zip line at all. And somebody stood way back from the zip line and took a photo, and it looked like there was almost like a dome of protection over the zip line. And so they went on with the zip line, um, and Mark, you know, a lot of people were amazed. But think about this, okay, Nathan, think about this. When, Mar when the CEO, the Jewish atheist CEO, needs help, when he's got a big problem in his life, when he's got a big problem in his company, do you think maybe Mark will have his ear now? Do you think Mark will be able to influence him? Absolutely. And think about the dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times, the story's been retold among the people, the customers, and the company workers who were there. Yeah. See, Mark had an influence, and it was more than just this supernatural event showing God was powerful. Mark had an influence on the CEO. He's got his ear now. And I've got lots of other stories like that, but it's, yeah. it's fun if we just believe, if we just believe that God cares about us. You know, if it matters to us, it matters to him. He's well, here's, here's what's really cool even in that. I mean, that's a, you know, I would say over on the side of like, hey, that's a, that's a big step in your faith, right? Right. Like, you know, if you're down on the bottom of the, the ladder and you're going to the CEO who's an atheist saying, can I pray for you? But a lot of times we can influence people by not what we do, but more about what we don't do. Yeah. Like if we don't lose our, you know, if we're sitting over in the break room reading our Bible and then an hour later we're getting in a shouting match with someone. Yeah. Are we giving the right, to, you know, as Timothy says, be thou an example. Are we being a good example? Well, no, because, you know, if somebody's coming at us, I mean, we, we can show our faith to people, but we don't have to, you know, go to them and say, hey, can I, yeah, that's great if you can, you know, go to and pray with them. But a lot of times if we can just be a good example by what we do, how we control ourselves, I mean, I've been guilty of that where I've been out, you know, at church on a Sunday and, you know, waiter or waitress brings me the wrong thing and I feel that anger coming up inside and I'm like, wait, you know, I'm wearing my Sunday you know, best, I need to be kind to this person. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really important. There's, uh, it's really sad, but, you know, there's waiters and waitresses who don't like to work out on Sunday because they get small tips and rude yeah. people. And I don't for the life of me comprehend how that could be. Well, because here's what people run into. Just because you're a Christian, just because you've accepted Jesus as your personal savior, it doesn't mean that all your problems are gone. Right. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden all the stress and conflict and all that is is wiped out. It means that you have hope and it means that you can have joy in your life. But what do you have to do to have joy in your life? What does James talk about? What do we have to do to have joy in our life? Yeah. yeah so, apply God's God's wisdom. Right. Exactly. Have you found that in your life? Have you found when you can look back at a time period and say, I wasn't doing things God's way. I didn't apply God's wisdom. I applied my own through pride or arrogance or bitterness or lack of forgiveness. And it ended up, it ended me in a place or my business in a place that had I applied God's wisdom, I wouldn't have been there. Absolutely. I just closed on the sale of a waterfront lot at Smith Mountain Lake that I owned for, you ready? almost 14 years. It was the worst real estate deal and the worst real estate or business decision I ever made. And I, it pains me to tell you how many hundreds of thousands of dollars I lost. But at the time that you made it, it was a good deal, right? Oh yeah. Everything seems like a good idea at the time. Every bad thing we're involved in always seems, nobody wakes up thinking, how can I lose $300,000 today? And I didn't think that when I went to look at this lot in late 2005. But 
um, I should have seen the signs. I read an article in Fortune Magazine or Entrepreneur Magazine right around that time saying the real estate uh, bubble is about to burst, and I ignored it. And a friend of mine warned me and said, don't buy that lot. Now, that same friend and I had worked together to buy over two dozen, maybe close to three dozen waterfront lots. And we had sold them all successfully, all but a handful successfully and with great profit. And he said, I won't be part of it. If you want to buy that lot, buy it yourself. And I did. And I thought, huh, I'm going to make twice as much profit now. Yep. Well, I lost over $300,000 on it. I finally had to take a tactic uh, back on February 2nd, Groundhog Day. I decided I was going to drop the price of the lot $1,000 that day and every day after that until the lot sold. And I dropped it a total of $115,000 over 115 days and finally sold it. And um, it was very, very painful, but it was costing me $7,000 a year to hold this thing. And uh, it was just throwing good money after bad. Can I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, and I think you touched on it when you bought it, the thought was making money. It wasn't yeah. where I needed to really be, or was this the good deal? And I mean, I've been there before where, uh, especially as a business person, where it's like you almost push all the little, the, the Holy Spirit is going, Hey dude, this is not a, you know, you don't need to be here, but you're like, Hey, get out of the way because I can make money. Mm -hmm. and every time I've done that, I might've made a little money up front, but ultimately I lost money in the long run because it wasn't where I was supposed to be. Right. Yeah. So true. And here's the unique thing about it. When you're there, did you feel alone? Did you feel like no one would understand what you were going through? You know, all these things that Satan puts in your mind because he doesn't want you to do what? Go talk to others. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, you know, this and this friend of mine, you and I still work together as partners in uh, a real estate business. And, um, you know, to this day, I mean, I mean, I lost, I lost enough. I mean, I was making, we were making about a hundred thousand dollars profit per lot. Um, and but you, you know, lost, lost six lots, six lots. Yeah, exactly. Sell, plus yeah. 14 years of yeah. stress. And, and if I, if I would have invested that exact same amount of money, into commercial real estate, into the same things we're investing in now, that 300 and some thousand dollars would have actually been well over, well over a million dollars now, easily yeah. in 14 years. And all the stress and all the misery and conflict that you would have avoided. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the importance of seeking counsel or wisdom or going and sitting down with another brother in Christ? And if you're a sister sitting with a sister in Christ and saying, hey, I'm considering doing this, but I've got a few questions here. You know, I've got a few concerns. Um, yeah. You want to touch on that? You got any good stories? Yeah. You know, like I said earlier, if it matters to us, it matters to God, even if it's a small thing, like asking, I asked for a parking space in downtown Chicago the other day when I couldn't find one on the street and I didn't want to pay $44 to go park in a garage. And I, I found a space. I, it mattered to God, you know? And um, I think these, these things are, uh, they do matter. But here's something I think that's really important to think about. The Bible is not a list of rules. It Correct. is not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's an invitation into a relationship. We have a good father. And he loves us and he wants to commune with us and he wants us to have wisdom. Now think about this, and I don't have the exact scripture references, but it's in the 20s, Proverbs 20 something. It says, answer a fool according to his folly and you'll basically become Be a, a fool. fool as well. Yep. And then the very next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly and you'll make him wise. And again, I don't have the exact wording. Wait, which is it, God? Which is it? I think it's really cool that he put those back to back because it punctuates this thought. We don't know what to do in every situation, but the Holy Spirit does. He knows exactly. I can read 10 books on marriage, but the Holy Spirit knows exactly how my wife was created and exactly how I need to love her. The Holy Spirit knows exactly how to answer the fool or not answer the fool, depending on the situation I'm in. We need a relationship. We need to rely on him. And I'll be honest, there's many people, I mean, the stories, there's 
probably thousands of books written about great entrepreneurs who were told that is a bad idea. And they went out and became the Thomas Edison's, the Bill Gates, Ford, Jeff Bezos, and the Fords of the world. So you can't just say because somebody said it was a bad idea that it was. In my case, that was exactly what happened. But there's other things I did that were, to, you know, I was told that were a bad idea, and we made a lot of money from it. Like the man camp we built, which was a multifamily housing facility in North Dakota. We made millions from that. We turned right around and built a Hyatt hotel. And my business partner actually owned that and he lost millions from it. So, you know, it's just not all cut and dry. We are, God's looking for a relationship with his children, just like we want one with our children, Nathan. And I think, you know, the scriptures point us to that relationship. Well, you know, you talk about that uh, of being told no or, you know, challenges. And there's examples, you know, Daniel, you talked about him earlier. I mean, he was told not to pray by the essentially the government. Well, at times there's times when you'll be told no, but it's still the thing that God wants us to do. Right. And sometimes we get into business and it's no because of the way we're trying to do it. So we need to adjust and do it more God's way, but it's not that he doesn't want us to go there. He just doesn't want us to go there that way. Right. And that really comes down to that relationship and being in tune with the Holy Spirit and and being guided because, you know, a lot of times, you know, if, if I'd have not asked my wife out again, the second time, she wouldn't be my wife. Yeah. Right. You know, And, and I know God made her for me and she's my best friend and we have a beautiful daughter together. But when we first met, I was dating somebody and she was dating somebody. Yeah. She found it rude that I would ask her out. I was like, well, I'll break up with the other girl because <laughs> we weren't that serious. But, yeah. you know, there are times when we have to take the no, but then readjust and then go do it the right way or a different right. way. Yeah, the Bible. Sometimes full. when there's no, that it means no, we don't need to go that way. Right. I mean, what if Moses would have said, okay, when God said, I'm not going with you, go on to the promised land alone. Go ahead. I'm not going with you. What if Moses would have said, okay. I mean, who knows what would have happened? He didn't say, it. he said, no, heaven forbid that you don't go with us. You got to go. Yeah. And he, he changed God's mind. And there's all kinds of examples. Well, even if Noah would have said no, none of us would be here. Oh, yeah, right. Exactly. Because <laughs> the population would have been wiped out, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, so, this reminds me that we're, um, we are, we have incredible access to heaven's resources. I mean, Jesus' most famous prayer was, he included the words on earth as it is in heaven. Yep. Well, what's going on in heaven? Well, there's no sickness, there's no poverty. There's no bad bosses and there's no lazy employees. We should expect that here on earth because it's our job to bring heaven to earth. And if we believe the world is going to get darker and darker and darker while Christians are going to just hang on to the rapture or to the end, that's that's not right. We're supposed to bring light. We're supposed to bring light to these seven spheres. And we have access to infinite creativity. God was first revealed before he was revealed as a father and a savior and a redeemer and all these other things, our healer. He was first revealed as a creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And think about this. Look at Bill Gates. Bill Gates was the wealthiest man in the world uh, for many years. And Bill Gates has done pretty well for himself considering he's operating on a quarter of your capacity, Nathan. He's operating on a quarter. Now think about it. Bill was made, he was created in the image of God, just like you and I and our whole audience. Well, he's done really, really well with that. But, you know, there's three other things that we have. Number two, we have the mind of Christ. And last I checked, Bill doesn't. Three, we have the Holy Spirit. And last I know, Bill doesn't. And we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. And as far as I know, Bill doesn't. So he's operating on a quarter of our capacity, Nathan, yet he's exploded in creativity. He hasn't been limited by our view that, well, missionaries are here and pastors are here and we're just lowly businessmen. He has taken his creative genius and, and used it to, and now he's impacting the world, you know, with 
tens, almost a hundred billion dollars in assets he's throwing at problems uh, to solve. We as believers have access to infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge, infinite power. We just have to believe. We got to start believing in our own salvation, Nathan. And that's the purpose of this show called Handling Life from a, a Bible-based, Christ-centered. You know, you, work, you walk into most churches on a Sunday morning, and what do you see? A bunch of people who look like they've been sucking on lemons. Yeah. We go to church functions, and there's this doom and gloom of, oh, woe is me. Yeah. It's like, and I was there for a long time. Like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, where is God? What is God doing in my life? Why isn't he doing this? And then it's kind of like, wait, God's right where he's always been. Mm-hmm. What am I not doing to tap into? You know, it's not that God has blessings for us, that if we do this, we're going to get this blessing. God's already set all those blessings out. We, he already has defined in James, we can have this joy. We can have his wisdom. We can have his blessings. But it's, got, it's exactly like the gift of salvation. We have to do our part. Right. Right. And sometimes we sit there and we say, well, God, why don't I have more money? God, why don't I have more this? Why don't I have more that? And it's like, and I'm saying this to myself, but I'm saying it to others. When's the last time I spent time in God's word? When's the last time I prayed other than, hey, God, provide for my needs? Mm -hmm. Right. That's a challenge that every Christian has is that God's there. It's up to you and me and everyone else to tap into, to develop that relationship and maintain that relationship with God. Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely true. And again, that's what it's about. It's about relationship. And he might lead you and I to do the same type of thing in completely opposite ways because it's about relationship. Do you think we overcomplicate religion with God? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, do. I think it's, uh, you know, it's about, a, it's, you know, he says, unless you become like little children, well, maybe we need to, to you know, stop doing the detailed analysis we do in, in, in with our spreadsheets and our complicated programs and, and get back to just asking, Holy Spirit, you care about me. What, what do you want me to do here? You know, I just read the life of the life story, 36 hours on Audible, actually of Warren Buffett. It's called the snowball. You know, he didn't even use a spreadsheet ever. He didn't even use a computer except That's crazy. Play bridge. Yeah. What? You know, all the analysis he did, and it wasn't just because he was a genius, though he obviously was. He, um, he didn't, com- he didn't overcomplicate things. Yeah. And he knew, he knew the system. He knew what he was doing. He had confidence in what he was doing. You touched on that earlier, you know, having confidence in God, having confidence in our prayer is one thing that we like. We can't have that confidence unless we have that relationship with God. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Hey, here's something I want to throw off of you and see if you agree. I struggled with a number uh, of this for a number of years of my life. What's God's will for my life? And I think that's a question that every Christian has asked himself or herself at one time, if not multiple times. Yeah. So I kind of came up with, I've been uncomplicating, unpacking my relationship with God. If, no matter what I'm doing, business, personal, fitness, whatever, if it keeps me neutral or pulls me away from God, it's not his will. Mm-hmm. If it brings me closer to him and I develop my relationship more with him, then it's his will. Yeah. You think that's a, is that too simplistic or is that, because a lot of times people I find, even in my own life, we'll, we will spend days, weeks, months, years going, well, I don't know what to do because I don't know what God's will is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really good. You know, I mean, uh, it's a famous quote, and I don't have it in front of me, but you've heard it before. Uh, Susanna Wesley, uh, John and Charles Wesley's mother had, I think it was 18 total children. And um, she had a quote that maybe you can find real quick, but she said, if there's anything at all, even if it's not sinful in itself, anything that makes your affections wane, anything that makes you more neutral, anything that pulls you away from your burning heart of love for God, then for you, for you, it is sin. That's cool. It says, um, I'd never heard this before, so maybe I read it somewhere in my... uh 
schooling and don't remember it and came back out, but it says, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish for spiritual things, whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in itself. Mm, thank you for finding that. That's good. And that's, you know, we, we as Christians at times, we say, oh, the, the big sins, the sexual sins, the, the big things, those are the ones that matter. But if you're putting TV in front of God, mm -hmm. if you're putting sports in front of God, you know, whatever you're putting in front of, um, you know, it talks about gossip being just as bad as sexual sins. Mm -hmm. Sin is sin, right? Right. Yeah. Con our, our consequences to us on earth can be different. Yeah. But in God's eyes, kind of what Susan Wesley's saying there, it doesn't matter if it's taking you off of the path that God wants you on, distracting you, it's sin, right? Right. Oh, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is to love our neighbor as ourself. If that's the greatest commandment that I'm kind of thinking that maybe the greatest sin is to violate those two. And so I think that's probably, although we maybe find scriptures here to debate this, um, maybe that's the root of all other sin, and that is not having a burning love relationship and with our. So, father. what's the what's the root of that sin? Why no, would you no. not love your neighbor? Why would you not love God with all your heart? Because you love yourself, yeah, more than you love God or your neighbor, which is pride, right? Which is Adam and Eve. The original sin was a pride-driven sin, right? Yeah, the, and, the Lucifer's sin in heaven and then Adam and yeah. Eve's on earth was both. It was all about me. You know, what can I do? And, and, I, and that's my big thing in this is pride. Pride keeps us from forgiving. Pride keeps us from being patient. Pride yeah. gets us to go buy land or do deals that we shouldn't because right. we think we can make more money. Right. Pride keeps us from saying sorry to our spouse or to our children. Mm-hmm. We can, it, it facilitates itself in other ways, but pride yeah. is one of those that there's good pride. You know, you got to be, got to take pride in yourself and your business. Right. But that's when I don't know about in your life, but that's to me, you know, in mine, that's my constant one that I really have to deal with because it keeps me from, you know, if I'm stressed out or if I'm anxious, it's hard to witness to someone. Yeah, really is. Because I'm in a bad mood or I'm right. depressed. Right. Definitely true. So how do you, how does someone who's going through that, if they're, you know, stressed out, they're anxious, they're in constant conflict, what are some things you found in your life that kind of, you know, have helped you deal with those matters? Well, there's a great book by uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf, L-E-A-F, Dr. Caroline Leaf, I believe she's from South Africa. She's a neuroscientist and a researcher. She's been at this, I think, well over 30 years, and it's called Switch on Your Brain. And she talks a lot about how our brains are neuroplastic. They can actually be changed, our brain, I'm talking about a physical thing called the brain, be changed by changing our mind first. And that may sound weird. I thought those were the same things. No, they're not. Sounds like what my parents used to tell me when I was growing up, like you need to get your brain right. Or is that <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. So our mind is something that's under our control and it should be under the Holy Spirit's great influence. We can choose to do things. We can make choices to, for example, fast, not from food though, from negativity. If we stop speaking negatively and thinking negatively, it will change our life. It will actually rewire our brain to be different. And here's something that I'm a little hesitant to share, and lest you laugh me off the program. But um, I something I do sometimes if I'm feeling really down or frustrated or I'm having to go into a meeting or a podcast and I'm, I'm having a bad so-called bad day, I will actually go find something really funny and laugh about it. And even if it's not funny, I'll intentionally laugh, which releases, I guess it's dopamine or something uh, from my brain, which actually brings me joy. And in getting that joy, 
then I can look at life completely differently. I also invite the presence of God into the meeting, into the podcast, into the conversation, and uh, have incredible results with that. You know, I normally just find a mirror, and that makes me laugh pretty good. You know, so but no, it, it well the 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 science and the medical. What is it? I don't remember the muscles. It takes more muscles to frown than it does to yeah. smile. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you know? You know, there's a thing called, and I, I, I might be saying it wrong, but it's, uh, I don't think anybody will catch it, but it's called a Duchenne smile, D-U-C-H-E-N-N-E, -N -N -E, I think. It's like a full face smile with involves your cheeks, your eyes, your smile. It actually impacts your reasoning ability and your thinking capacity and the ability to solve problems. Yeah. Think about it. If you're smiling like that a lot, and you're getting that kind of wisdom, you know, from God through your brain, well, it's going to impact your ability to function and perform at work. It's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Well, and that's one of those that really is the key to this is the choice. Yeah. You can right. choose to be unhappy or you can choose to be happy. You can choose to find the goodness the silver liner. And man, sometimes that's really hard. If you're going, if you got a sick child or, you know, somebody's going through a really hard time in, in your life or, you know, somebody that you know and love, it's yeah. really hard to find the silver liner unless you're doing it from a God perspective. Right. Right. That's so true. But yeah. what has happened in a lot of our lives is even the small things, the daily routine stuff has become really overwhelming to people, Christians, that they just, they just look like they're, and they are miserable. Yeah. They're sad. They're depressed. They're in conflict and they're not turning to God and saying, Hey, I'm going to turn this over to you and let you do it. Like in the scriptures, God says, bring, lay things at my throne. Yeah. Bring your, your worries. You bring your tired and your weary and mm -hmm. find rest. Right. But we don't do it. I think that's a big problem with Christians is because we believe we should be, and we know actually we should be living here, but we are actually living here. Yeah. And that, you know, and I'm showing a, ga a gap again, if you're listening, but the point is if we think this and we believe this and we know that we're supposed to be this, but we're actually that, then that discontinuity brings turbulence internally and it makes us unhappy. Yeah. I have a commitment to, um, be kind and loving and actually offer to pray for almost everybody I meet in public, whether it's a waiter, waitress, uh, cashier, um, uh, even sometimes even people on a customer service phone line. And when I don't do that, I become noticeably, internally at least noticeably, unhappy yeah. because I've got this commitment that I'm not following through on. Yep. Yeah. And so what happens in people's minds if you've been away from God for so long and you've said multiple times, oh, I'm going to get right with God yeah. tomorrow. tomorrow. I'm, going, I'm going to start going to the gym tomorrow. Right. And we, tomorrow becomes next week and next week becomes next month. Right. And then we're into years and it's like, well, it's been so long. Why even try? Right. Yeah. But your relationship with God, I mean, as you know, God's sitting there going, I don't care how long you've been Jonah. I don't care how long you've been wandering off. Come back. Yeah, it's very true. And we, if we're not talking with others, Satan will put things into our mind and convince us that God doesn't care about us, that God doesn't love us, that God won't restore us. What is he going to – the best one I always laugh about in my mind now was, you know, what's God going to think about me if I tell him what's going on in my life? Yeah. God already knows. Yeah. I don't have to. Yes, I need to tell him, but he doesn't need to be told. He already knew where I was. Of course. So, brother, as we uh, wrap up today, what um, as far as from from this podcast and where we're coming and what's going on in, in your life, you want to share a little bit of what God has laid on your heart uh, for others today? Yeah. You know, so Wellings Capital is we are so excited to be able to bring, you know, uh, investors uh, access to the historical returns of commercial real estate and the also the tax benefits which are amazing and so we've got these great um, you know these operators we invest in these multifamily self-storage mobile home parks we invest in but I've got to be honest um, 
I am talking about the stuff. I told the story of Mark and the zip line and Bill Gates access, you know, based on his creativity or Daniel and Joseph and Esther. But, but, you know, I don't know if I'm really living it. You know, today, like today, we had a meeting this morning and said, who are we going to hire to be our next executive assistant for our company? And we're puzzling and we're thinking about going in indeed.com and we're wondering where are we going to find this employee? Another question I had is, we, we have our growth fund paused right now because we haven't got any great ground up or steep value add development deals. And we're kind of puzzled. Where are we going to find these? LoopNet. We're going to go to LoopNet and find another deal? Yeah. No, no. But um, at any rate, um, we're, we're wondering about these and we're puzzling and we almost finished the meeting. And I said, oh, why don't we pray? You know, so I, I, I'm finding this and there is that same gap again I mentioned just a moment ago. You know, I believe all this. I talk about supernatural investing. I talk about running a supernaturally uh, business, you know, where we're depending on God to, inter to act with, you know, on our behalf, like Mark did or Joseph in the Bible. But I'm not necessarily doing it. And so the challenge for me is where are we going to, you know, how am I going to find those things, those resources that God already has for us. And so yeah. that's what I'm challenging myself and our listeners with today, Nathan. And that's a challenge. If we're, if Christians are honest with themselves, mm -hmm. I don't care how close they are to God. That's still a day by day, right. moment by moment challenge to stay in that mindset that not what can I do, but what can I do through God? Right. What yeah. can God do through me? Because, yeah. I mean, you, you know, I, I, I fall into the same thing. It's like, oh, you know, I do this and I go out and I speak and I write books and do podcasts. And then I'll find myself spending, you know, half day, couple of days a week trying to figure something out. Then I'm like, you know what? I need to pray about this. Right. Absolutely. I need to go, I need to go sit down and talk to somebody about this in it's amazing how many times when I get stumped on something, if I'll go sit down and talk with my wife or a, a brother in Christ and say, this is what I'm going through. Yeah. This is what I've come up with. And they go, oh, would you think about this? And they tell me something that I've not even thought about. And in 30 seconds or 30 minutes, they resolve a problem that I've been working on for weeks. Right. Absolutely. Because there's counsel and wisdom in others. Mm -hmm. It's very true. And then, I'll, then, you know, a month later, I'll run into the same thing and I'll waste two or three weeks of my time, be stressed out and anxious. And all I need to do is go seek God's wisdom through others, which is what he says in his scripture. Right. Absolutely true. Yeah. And so when we're not doing that, again, we can become unhappy and we don't even know why. But we know we're supposed to do it this way and we're doing it that way and that gap causes turbulence, unhappiness, unrest. And of course, God can use that turbulence to draw us back into what? A relationship. A relationship. With a good father. Yep. Brother, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you or about your testimony or about your yeah. business? They can come to our website, which is wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S capital c-a-p-i-t-a-l wellingscapital.com they can look me up there brother i appreciate your time and i'll put you know links to your to your site and various things in, inside of this i really appreciate you taking your time to not only share with us but to be vulnerable and be open about that hey you know even you have struggles in your walk with the lord because I think that's a really important for people to hear. Yes, that God has done these great and wonderful things for me, but I also have struggles. Right. Yeah. Thanks, and man. I also have fears and I have stumblings, but I'm trying to be better, but I'm not perfect. Right. Yeah. And I think that's really important for people to understand that you're not going to reach perfection on this earth. Right. Yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have struggles. Well, I've got a podcast called "How to Lose Money" just to prove that. <laughs> exactly. So, brother, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I look forward to um, talking to you again in the future. And thank you again so much for all right. Thanks, Nathan. Life.